was meant to be self-reflexive, maybe de-skilled, to Jack's point, abstract. These sculptures, by contrast, all of those that I just showed, were too illusionistic, too ostensibly unaware of their making, too humanist, too narrative, too crafty, and ultimately too anthropomorphic, or we could say figurative. So what happened to make it possible that today many of these same pejoratives might be defanged in the face of work by Fritsch, Kuhns, or Ray? Uh, you see here things that are narrative, that are figurative, that are well-crafted, that are illusionistic. Um, after all, these sculptures uh, would kind of seem to fit the bill in a way. Uh, and it's even fair to assume that there's a, <clears throat> and I would, sorry, question. Is it fair to assume that there's such a strong line in the sand between these artists that we're talking about today and those I just mentioned? Would it be mere pseudomorphism to see a greater continuity between the work of someone like George Siegel and Katerina Fritsch, as this slide suggests? And you're seeing a piece of George Siegel's at the bottom in the Guggenheim's collection from the late 60s and Katarina Fritsch's more recent sculpture from circa 2000. And there are great differences between them. Obviously, in making a point like this, one seems to get very schematic, but helps in 10 minutes. So if I had to point to one factor, and I think there are many, but that has already been named and I've been thinking a lot about, in terms of what might have marked this fork in the road between the kind of figurative sculptures that I've just shown and those um, that Jack is proposing uh, for his exhibition, I'd say that one of the major contributing factors would be a renewed interest in the ready-made that occurred in the early 80s and the work of all three of the artists in question, and they're certainly not the only one. And I should caution again that these sculptures on the screen and all the ones that I'm going to show as comparisons have great differences from one another, but they were made within a span of just a few years, and they share, in this case, a common interest in common objects and how those objects live in space. A thermos or a hoover, um, in the case of Ray's work and, and Kunz's, could both be found at a Walmart, but in Kunz's and Ray's hands, they become subject to strange forces that elicit in us a certain sense of wonder. In the post-minimal art of Richard Serra or Linda Benglis, gravity acted on lead plates or liquids became solids or abstract puddles, but Kunz and Ray in some sense explored these physical states in relation to consumer goods. And in subsequent years, both these artists would transition from working with found things to creating bespoke renditions of them, as Michelle mentioned. In a way, it could be said that for Ray, Fritsch, and Kuhns, the ready-made was a device through which represent, representation could slip back into sculpture. For example, the central sculptural problem of Kuhns's early work was one of presentation. You see that in the top pictures from the late 70s. How to display found objects that he was fascinated by. But by 1985, the problem, as you see in the two lower works from 85 and 86, became one of representation. The casting process came to supplant framing or display as Kunz's chief editorial inflection so that his replicated products elegantly contained within themselves a new metaphorical surplus. The heavy material that grants his flotation devices like the uh, aqua lung that you see here also makes them a kind of haunting deathly imago. Or the leather travel bar that's robbed of its use value becomes a kind of allegory of attainment, vice, maybe dying customs, while evoking the gentleman who might have aspired to carry it. The artist, like the priest during communion, to borrow the Eucharistic example again that Michelle uh, already put on the table, he performs a kind of material transubstantiation that turns a found thing into art, a useful thing into a symbolic one. Kuhns, Fritsch, and Ray, I would say, in their relationship to these ready-mades, have a kind of sixth sense for making ordinary things blossom into archetypes. For Ray, this is often a function of scale, but I think in general, their secret lies in the harmonizing of the specific and the generic, in both their selection of subjects and their fabrication or crafting of them. Their sources often suggest a kind of thing, but not any one thing in particular. The Italian woman, for example, of Kuhn's, typifies a certain kind of art from a certain time without being recognizable as a masterpiece, just as Fritsch's devotional figurines summon their religious subjects, but maybe not quite precisely their models. This generic quality, I'd say, is intensified by the virtue of their casting. On the one hand, their sculptures are so replete in their fine detail that they suggest their models' original materials and draws into a kind of delectation of their surfaces in a very slow way. But on the other hand, they lack particularities such as color that might localize or limit a viewer's associations. And I don't, these are not exactly the sources of these objects, but I just was 
thinking more and more about the kind of thing that these artists would start with and then where maybe they would end up in terms of their sculpture. This tension between the generic and the specific in a way, both in terms of the subject that's chosen and the way that the artist deals with it is very evident in a work like The Rabbit where you see this kind of blank face, but at the same time, there's this incredibly minute modeling and this kind of puckering around the edges of the, the ears, let's say. And that, to me, this is kind of central to the, its capacity, this object, to absorb our seemingly limitless projections in a way that maybe the images I just showed of the found sources could not, or even this rabbit. So suddenly, this, this ready-made object becomes a faceless orator, a helmeted spaceman, a playboy, a bunny, a totem of resurrection, all the things that, that Kuhn's and many critics have, have discussed it as being. Like all the works in the past three slides, I should also say that this sculpture is a representation of a representation. It's a sculpture of a toy in the guise of a rabbit. So indeed, if Kuhn's had begun his love affair with the ready-made by presenting real things, and then he shifted to depicting them, now he was representing real things that represented other things. And this is a double remove that, for me, catches within its crosshairs the distinction between an object and a work of art. Uh, this is the wrong slide. Uh, let's see. I want to show a Charles Ray. Well, this is fine. Um, anyway, the, the, I don't have the right, where's the? Anyway, let's, let's say this, that, that what I was just saying about a sculpture that's representing an object that's representing something else is also true in Charles Ray's work at times, as in the case of this boy. It's true in, in Kunz's Lobster. It's true in uh, Fritsch's sculptures of a figurine that depicts a saint. And for me, this self-reflexive relationship to representation is a kind of ironic corollary of the ready-made's role in the work of these artists. And I say it's ironic because Duchamp, of course, revealed that an artwork's only essential ingredient was an artist's designation of something as such. While these recent clones are the result of countless hours and dexterous hands and sophisticated machines, as Michel has pointed out. And if Duchamp claimed that he selected his objects because of his indifference to them, the artists under discussion today, I would say, probably choose their models precisely for their narrative and emotional charge. That's another kind of important thing I see in all of them in relation to the ready-made. Already for the pop artists of the 1960s, here we go, the ready-made served less as a strict model than as conceptual license to translate the dross of the everyday world into art by handmade, if deadpan, representations of comic books, advertisements, and other workaday stuff. But close attention to any of these precedents reveals the sculptures to be something other than what they purport. And their meaning as artworks derives in part from the way that the artist, while cleverly aping industry, always shows his hand. This is not so for Kuhn's, it's often not so for Ray or Fritsch, who've pushed these precedents to an absurdly logical conclusion, both upping and vanishing their manual investment while closing the, the loop between the found object and the facsimile. I think you see that better here. And if the ready-made improbably opened a back door to representation, I think it also then offered a new approach to figuration for these artists who have all gone on to make other figurative works after those that I've just shown. And this, finally, may be what distinguishes the manifestations and sculptures that are in question today from those figurative sculptures with which I began my talk. The figures that populate the work of Kuhn's, Fritsch, and Ray, they're not direct depictions of jugglers or dancers, which is to say depictions of people. They're depictions of things depicting people. They've been mediated by the double remove of industry and artistic effort. And to our eyes, that may feel more conceptually stringent and, dare I say, contemporary. Thank you.